Intervertebral disc disease is one of the most common problems in veterinary neurology and is the most common spinal disorder in dogs. Degenerative intervertebral disc disease can lead to disc herniation or rupture, which can potentially cause irreversible spinal cord damage if not addressed properly or quickly enough. The structure of the intervertebral disc can actually be compared to that of a jelly donut. There are two main components, the jelly-like inner center or nucleus propulsus, composed of glycosaminoglycans, and the more firm and fibrous outer ring, the annulus fibrosus, which is composed mainly of collagen. Typically, when problems occur, the gelatinous inner portion ruptures through the fibrous outer ring. The disc material gets trapped underneath the spinal cord and causes compression. When discs rupture very forcefully, we can also see a concussive or bruising injury to the spinal cord. Intervertebral disc disease affects both dogs and cats, with dogs more commonly and frequently affected. In dogs, the chondrodystrophic breeds, such as Dachshunds, French Bulldogs, and Shih Tzus, are the most highly predisposed. Other very commonly affected breeds include Beagles and German Shepherds. It is important to remember that disc problems can occur in any breed of dog and at any age, though it is very uncommon prior to one year of age. Though somewhat rare in cats, disc disease does occur, and we tend to see this when they are in their older years. Clinical signs of intervertebral disc disease can be variable, but the most common signs include neck or back pain, a wobbly gait, which is called ataxia, weakness, or even complete paralysis. If a disc rupture occurs in the neck or cervical spine, then the signs can affect all four limbs. When a disc ruptures along the longer stretch of the back or thoracolumbar spine, then we will see only the hind limbs affected. There are five major grades of clinical signs secondary to disc herniation. Grade one is when a patient is experiencing only pain. There are no neurologic deficits. Grade two is a patient who also has weakness in one or more limbs, but is still able to walk. They may be dragging the toes when they walk. Grade three is a patient who can no longer walk, but can still move their legs if they are supported. This is called non-ambulatory tetra or paraparesis, depending on how many limbs are affected. Next, grade four is a patient who can no longer move their limbs, so is considered paralyzed. However, this patient can still feel their toes. These patients are often unable to urinate on their own. Finally, the most serious grade of spinal cord injury, grade five, is a patient who is paralyzed and can no longer feel the toes or tail. This is called loss of pain perception. These patients are also unable to urinate on their own. Definitive diagnosis of intervertebral disc disease or disc herniation requires advanced imaging of the spine. Radiographs can identify evidence of disc degeneration or calcification and is a good screening tool to evaluate for other bone lesions such as cancers or infections. However, radiographs cannot be used to definitively diagnose intervertebral disc herniation as the intervertebral discs and spinal cord cannot be properly visualized. Although a CT scan is an excellent imaging modality, this test does not guarantee identification of a herniated disc and it also does not allow us to thoroughly evaluate the spinal cord itself. MRI is the diagnostic modality of choice for intervertebral disc herniation, as it provides excellent detail of all of the structures of the spine and spinal cord. It allows us to determine the degree of spinal cord compression and which side is most severely affected. MRI helps us to determine if there is pathology within the spinal cord itself, which cannot be detected with any other imaging modality. MRI also helps us to discern chronic bulging discs from more acutely herniated discs. There are two main treatment options for intervertebral disc herniation. The first is a conservative medical approach. This is most successful in the grade one and two patients, which again are those patients who are just painful or painful and a bit weak and wobbly. Treatment is aimed at managing pain as well as reducing inflammation. Strict crate rest for no less than six weeks is absolutely imperative for a successful outcome. In patients who do not respond to this type of treatment approach or for those who are unable to walk on presentation, then a surgical approach is recommended. The two most common surgical procedures are a ventral slot when the disc herniation occurs in the neck and a hemilaminectomy when it occurs in the thoracolumbar spine. Other types of procedures may be indicated depending on the precise location of the ruptured disc material. Postoperatively, the patient is monitored in the hospital and is typically kept on intravenous pain and anti-inflammatory medications. The neurologic status of the patient is assessed multiple times each day until they are deemed stable enough and comfortable enough to return to the care of their owners. Most are discharged within three to five days, though some patients may stay longer. The most imperative and crucial part of at-home care is crate rest, 
so that proper and complete healing can occur. For the first two weeks, patients are only allowed to go for short, controlled leash walks for five minutes, three to four times a day, just for the purpose of urination and defecation and getting a breath of fresh air. They must be crated at all other times. Their activity will gradually be increased over the following weeks, but they cannot return for, to full activity for at least three months. Furthermore, some indefinite lifestyle changes may need to be made, such as preventing jumping up and down off of furniture and certain types of play, such as tug of war or jumping for balls and frisbees. Prognosis for intervertebral disc disease is completely dependent on the status of the patient at the time of diagnosis. The most important factor in determining prognosis is the presence or absence of deep pain perception. In grade three or four patients, there is an approximately 95% chance of complete recovery with surgery and an approximately 65% chance of recovery without surgery, but with proper medical therapy and rest. In grade five patients who have lost deep pain perception, Prognosis for recovery falls to about 50 to 60% chance with surgery and only about 5% chance with conservative management. It is also important to remember that about 20% of patients will suffer from recurring disc problems throughout their lifetime, but typically this does not affect their prognosis for another recovery. We hope you found this information helpful. Intervertebral disc disease is a very manageable problem in our canine and feline patients, but without timely intervention, it can progress quickly and cause irreversible spinal cord injury.